so, so I'd like to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, your experiences, anything you wish to share. Great. Well, thank you. And, and you know, I appreciate this opportunity. And, and first of all, I just want to say thank you to you uh, for all your efforts. You persevere through difficult times. You are so giving to your students and your colleagues and to communities outside of Duke and, and inside of Duke and the hunger uh, efforts you're doing. And, and I just have great admiration for you. And, and, uh, and I'm grateful that, uh, that uh, we are in each other's lives. So thank you for that, first of all. Um, so I, I grew up in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, and uh, was, had five, uh, four brothers and a sister. And uh, my dad was a, uh, a cigar distributor. And so he, uh, he went around to the grocery stores and built those, actually I built those racks for 25 cents a rack. Wow. And he stocked the different cigars. And, and uh, so that was his job, you know, kind of uh, white collar but uh, lower middle income. And um, so I, you know, always wanted to go to Notre Dame and uh, worked very hard, but we didn't have the financials to do that. And uh, right after the Vietnam War, it ended, it became an all volunteer draft. So I was, um, had a great guidance counselor at school. And she said, you know, there's this thing called a, an ROTC scholarship and it, uh, it's they couldn't recruit many officers, and so if you are interested in serving some time in the military, then you get accepted to any college in the country that has uh, an ROTC program, and uh, you can have your education paid for for four years, and in return you would give the the army four years of your uh, service. And so I, I said, well, I can do that. And it got me the goal of, of going to Notre Dame. And, and, um, and then immediately after that, I went into the Army thinking I was going to serve the four years. And I met my wife of 37 years in my first assignment, had her first daughter out at Fort Lewis, Washington. And then our next assignment, we had our second daughter. And uh, they're now in their 30s. And uh, my oldest has three children ages two four and six and you know they're the the light of our eyes and both daughters have moved here so we're we're really in a, a just a great place and the military i uh, i was responsible for uh, uh, readiness and uh, leader development and community management and, uh, and i spent 30 years and i spent time in um, iraq and saudi arabia and, and uh, kuwait um, I spent time with 1st Armored Division in Bosnia in the uh, mid-90s when uh, those uh, uh, civil wars were going on, um, that instability in that region. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Pentagon. Uh, about 12 years of my 30-year career, over about three assignments were spent in the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it came time to, to get out, um, after 30 years, I, I tried to think of where uh, – where could I go where I felt there was a purpose and a sense of mission that I had every day getting up? And, um, and I had a friend who worked in healthcare here at Duke, and we had been, for, you know, lifelong friends, you know, since I was uh, a young captain in the Army. And um, we'd served together in a few assignments. And he was here at Duke as the HR director, and he introduced me to a few folks when I got out of the Army. And and pretty soon, I, I started working for this place called uh, Duke Health Technology Solutions, and and that was about nine and a half years ago, and uh, I haven't looked back. So it wow. brings me where I am today, and, and I, I'm responsible for all the, the customer-facing uh, services that we offer in technology and IT to uh, Duke Health. Okay. Chief Operating Officer for DHTS. That's correct. Okay. So let me ask you first about your different assignments. What kinds of people did you encounter? So I'm assuming a very diverse you know, diversity of, of, of everything in the various places you, you've been. Can you tell me about some of those interactions and how you feared and how the other person fared? 
fared? In other words, how it turned out for, for you both? Yeah, you know, the, the Army was a, a pivotal time in my life. I, I'd not been to a lot of uh, places. I had not experienced uh, life outside of uh, Indiana. And, uh, and I grew up in an, inside of an environment that was, um, um, I would say, racist. And, um, and I had those same prejudices in my own family. And my father was um, a second generation Italian immigrant. And, um, you know, at that time, the Italians, when they came into the country and the, my grandfather came in the uh, late 1800s were the were on the, the lower part of the, the spectrum of, of immigrants that came in and uh, they replaced the Irish. And so they were uh, greatly discriminated against. And, and my father grew up with that. And in his world, uh, you know, people of color were uh, not equal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was not a bad, he just had a, a view of life that was, um, you know, you stayed in, in your area, Indiana, Indianapolis is a very segregated city. And um, you crossed Indiana Avenue and you got into what my dad would say was the bad part of town. And it just was simply because on that side of town was uh, predominantly a black community. Uh, I remember the age of five, we moved out of a neighborhood, and I learned later that we moved out of that neighborhood because uh, black families started moving into the neighborhood. Um, I went to Catholic schools, and uh, there was never uh, color in those Catholic schools. I went to Notre Dame and experienced the uh, same thing. There were very few minorities, and it was a very much of a white privileged uh, environment. And so I came in my first uh, 22 years of life with this very jaded background. So when I entered the military and I got into various assignments, um, you know, I, I just was very cautious when I met people. I was probably a little bit judgmental. And I soon learned that the people that led me were people of color, male and female. The people who trained me in, in my job skills and that helped me develop uh, as an officer were men and women of color. And so it, it took a few years, but after a while, there were only two colors that I saw in the military. And, and one was that army green, that uniform of our country. Um, and I didn't see color beyond that. And then it was very real for me when we deployed for combat that, uh, you know, everyone's blood is the same color. It doesn't matter the pigmentation of your skin. Um, we all took an oath to defend this nation. We all took an oath to sacrifice our lives, whether you were uh, black or brown or white or gay or straight. Um, we were all there for the same reason. And that united me in my mind and thought and was a pivotal point for me to where um, you know, I was ashamed of where I had come from. Uh, again, not, not being a participant in those things. Uh, I have never used the N word in my life. I'd heard it a lot growing up. Um, but it was a pivotal point for me in the military to realize that we're all equal, that this is a group that we're all taught the same thing. We're all willing to do the same thing for each other, the person on your right, the person on your left, and it changed me. Um, so I, you know, I had many assignments where it was very much, uh, uh, very diverse. I mean, every assignment I was in was very diverse. I think the Army uh, has a lot of diversity. They've, they've made up a little bit more so in, in uh, women. Uh, they were only about uh, maybe 20, 25%, but that's, that has been changing. They've allowed women in combat roles, but it's a very pivotal point for me. Excellent. So I did an interview earlier this week with a woman who was in the Marine Corps, and that's just a black woman. She owns her own business, and um, she's been very successful in life. And we talked a little bit about her military career. 
And she expressed to me, and I don't know if you looked at the channel since the last time I seen the link, but um, her, her interview was there. And she expressed to me the amount of um, discrimination, microaggressions, and then flat out racism she experienced in the military. And she said it was in part of the reason why she left uh, was because she had felt like eight years she hadn't made much progress, although she had learned discipline and she had learned a lot of things about organization that she had not had prior to joining the military. But uh, she said that she never felt like she belonged because someone was always questioning her judgment or whether her bed was made tight enough or whether her, her stance and her salute were, 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 were correct. And she said that constant pushing down on you when you're already feeling uncertain about whether you belong in this country as a whole became more than she could stand. Have you ever heard or experienced any of that from any of your, the people that reported to you or the people that were your peers or either your superiors? Uh, yes, I, I have heard those uh, unfortunate uh, stories. And, you know, I, I think that the Army is a huge melting pot of our um, society at the probably lower income, lower middle income um, areas. I mean, you don't get a lot of people that enter the military that come from uh you know, wealthy families. And it's, it's usually an opportunity that, that's waiting for someone when they get out of, uh, of uh, high school or don't have options. And, and uh, you know, that was the way it was, was always presented. Um, and you look at the, your friends in high schools, and at least when I was, was growing up, and the ones that went in the military were the ones that weren't going to go to college. And so you get this cross-section of, people from the south you get this cross-section of of you know people from the north where never has there ever been uh, a huge component of of race in their population and and uh, it I know that it happened I mean we established uh, equal opportunity officers in every unit because uh, that had happened and as a as a way to go to someone and so just like in our society today, I'm sure that there were, uh, there were pockets uh, and probably more so than, than I would have ever been aware of, if not for you know, recent uh, movements to actually listen to people, actually ask people um, how they're doing. I mean, we just didn't do that. It was almost taboo, you know, to go up to someone and ask, you know, how are you doing? And, and, uh, you know, are you, have you felt this type of discrimination did that? And, uh, and I think that, uh, uh, I, I'm sure it exists, probably still exists in our, in our military. Let, let me share this with you. Um, so I don't remember when and how I met you. I think it may have been at Tech Expo of 2012, 13 or 14. I don't remember exactly when. Um, and when I first met you, I was a little bit intimidated by you because you were such an organized and completely structured and disciplined person where I have been a little bit of all over the place, you know, so my emotions go up, down, east, west, north, south. And uh, when I first met you, you shook my hand and I think you gave me a, a medal for my presentation or for co-chairing Tech Expo. And since that time, you have been an ever presence in my life. And uh, when you have time, you come to some of the um, feedings and gatherings we have at the house. And uh, I think I might have just recently told you this through an email I sent to a larger group. But uh, the last event we had where you attended, there were several young black men. Um, and many, if not all of them, had experienced white men very differently than the Dan Bruno who walked in the front door. And so as you talked to each of them, spent time with each of them, each one left with an impression that you were more than just a COO or a, a high ranking military official, but a real human being. And I could say that same thing too. I feel like I can tell you my problems. I can ask for your help. I can ask for help for others. And you have always, always been there hundred percent. And I think that speaks so much to your character regardless of how you are raised or the experiences you have, the man that you are 
is exactly just a wonderful human being. I just want to say that. Well, thank you. That that really means a lot to me. Yeah. And, and so I, the purpose of saying that was to, to say this question to you. So having a, a, a fairly old black woman as your friend, as your colleague, as your uh, coworker, um, some people see that as different, for lack of a better word. So um, they assume things that may not be fact. You know, maybe we're having a relationship or maybe I don't even know all the things I've been heard so far. And I have a large number of white men as my friend and colleagues and coworkers. And I hear this almost all the time. So do you feel any strangeness with having me as your friend? And I'm sure you have black and brown people that report to you as well. Do you feel any strangeness when you're interacting with those people one-on-one? -on -one? Not at all. I mean, uh, you know, again, I, I think, uh, I learned my lesson of, of judging people because of the, the color of their skin. You know, I, I learned to judge people because of the way I grew up. I just learned that there was, there was a difference. And then the army undid that for me. And, and I don't see a difference. As long as someone can do their job or is willing to be a friend to me as I am to them, I, I don't see that, that difference in color. I, it's not, intimidating to me but i will just tell you the last uh, couple weeks i have i have learned a great deal um i have i have been touched by the stories i hear um i've actually felt um a little bit disenfranchised from um uh, from the military you know coming out of the military and thinking that we were were defending the rights of the country uh, that I believed to exist at the time for 30 years, and then going along my happy way for, you know, uh, nine years, and then the the Black Lives Matter movement and the killings of of uh, Ahmaud Arbery and and uh, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. It, I mean. When when those demonstrations and, and and protests took place, and and I was trying to understand, you know, first of all, what I was asking myself, what what can I do? And and in a way, I was justifying in my mind that, look, you've been doing this for you know the greater part of your life, you're already doing it. But I said, no, that that's just not enough. And and so I was reading on some things, and it said, ask people, ask, talk to people about it. And, and I knew that could be very uncomfortable, but I started asking people about their experience and, and you know, the, 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 the deep things that you share and some of my, my coworkers, I would ask their experience and it never dawned on me that this very successful black woman, great family, that every day, they worry, as you do, about their sons going out and getting from point A to point B safely. Um, I heard from a, 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 another person in our organization, a, a black man who's a veteran who retired from the Army, that, you know, you're going back and forth to work every day and you're wearing that Army uniform. You're not the same kind of target, but once he took that uniform off, he was tearful. He broke down in tears because he said, I, I have a family of five to take care of. I have a sick mother that I'm taking care of. And I worry every day if I'm going to come home uh, safe to be able to continue to provide for them because I'm the basic provider. And, and it just dawned on me that this isn't the country I thought that I was defending and the rights that I thought I was standing up for, it, 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 it's really hurt. And I've felt that, you know, being disenfranchised a bit from, from our country and, and what's going on. And, and, you know, so we started more listening sessions with our organization and they're very well received. And, and the stories that I'm hearing and the experiences that I'm hearing are just, 
they're horrifying to me. I mean, I, I thought that that doesn't happen with with all of you. You're great, successful, got great jobs. You're a dude. You know, you got great families. I've interacted with you. That didn't happen to you, and all the time. And you just wear it, and you just do it, and get through it. And I, you know, I just I, it, it hurts me greatly. Yeah, I, I will tell you. You know, so. Um, since I started doing these diversity chats, I've gotten a gazillion people who want to do one now and get get something off their chest. And I open it up to them you know, to say whatever you want to say. I'm not, you know, managing it or trying to elicit a, a specific response. Whatever you want to say, you say. Um, once the recording is done, I send it to the person for them to review. If they want to do over, we do over. But but. As you said, so since 1619, when Africans were first brought from Africa to various parts of the world, we have been seen as inferior, but sometimes inhu inhuman, and more times than not invisible and voiceless. And yes, I work at Duke. I am a senior IT manager. I have great responsibilities. But even at my own university, hiring for me it's like a it's, a, it's a game of chance. You know, there's a 50-50 chance I'll get an interview. There's a 50-50 chance I'll, I'll run up into the possible candidates that they would hire. And my experience is not unique. I can't tell you how often I'll have a black or brown person come to me and say, can you help me? Can you connect me with this person? I'm trying to get a job. I've applied so many times, I've never heard anything back. So we, we struggle just to stay alive. We struggle to find employment to feed and give, give our friends, families a chance at the American dream. We fight to find a way to make our voices heard, which it is not. And so these protests and these demonstrations and all these different things, and I'll say one little caveat to that. A lot of my white friends said, well, why are you looting and, and rioting? And uh, someone said to me in one of these talks that really, really hit me because you haven't been listening to me no matter what else I've been saying to you, so I'm trying to get your attention. Now, I don't condone, you know, burning buildings down or breaking things or stealing things. I think that's not proper. But if it's the only way you get people's attention, maybe maybe that's what you do. I would never do that, but maybe that's what you do. And so you're, you're, you being here with me has more than anyone could really know because you are like second or third in line of probably one of the biggest IT organizations uh, in Durham. Oh, yeah. Yeah, th that's impressive. And the fact that you have a relationship with this lowly IT manager at law school, you know, it's just impressive as well. You know, it's just truly impressive. And again, I said, it speaks to your character and who you are. But what I want to ask you with, that, with what all I've just said, what did you think of when you saw that law enforcement officer with his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds? I... I... You know, total loss of trust and faith in our police officers, and and I know that's unfair because I know, as in any profession, there are good people trying to do good. But to know in this day and age that that type of treatment and subduing someone in that way, no matter what the color of skin, but in this case, particularly the color of skin, is just wrong. And it's just, you know, there, there's lack of compassion. I mean, I can't breathe. I mean, what, there were three officers there and he was handcuffed. I mean, why couldn't they at least provide some relief to him? Because he was already overtaken, overpowered. It, it you know, it, and, and I've thought about it since and it just probably feels like to the to the black community that that's how we felt all of our life is the white man has had their, has been stepping on our neck all of our lives. Absolutely right, you are absolutely correct. So when we saw Rodney King beat, beaten in, in California, we thought, well, there will be justice. No, um, when James Byrd Jr. was attached by a rope to the back of a pickup truck in Texas and drove for three miles, we thought we'd see justice. And each time we see these things in the public domain, we think, maybe, just maybe. But more times than not, 
everybody protests, riots, say a lot of things, and then we go back to the same old thing. You know, we have not had equal opportunity at wealth. We have not had equal opportunity to become a COO or CTO or CIO. We have not had those opportunities. I was, uh, I did a, a clap. A conference call yesterday and that's all the liberal arts colleges all of their membership you know in IT and in uh, HR and diversity was on this call I think it was 140 some people on this call and every single person said the exact same thing if I'm a diversity officer I'm a diversity officer in name only I have no power to affect change if I'm in IT and and clack and I didn't really understand this until uh, Michael Cato said it he said there are three black CIOs among 75 schools, three. And he said, he doesn't even know if they're brown um, CIOs, you know, so, and when you think about that, it's kind of one of those things where you think, well, why am I not equal? Why am I not qualified? Why am I not possibly worthy of having a job more than I have? So we struggle to see if we're gonna stay alive. Can we keep our families fed? Can we hold on to our homes? Can we save some money? Can we retire? So in addition to seeing the, the knee on Mr. Floyd's neck, it's a knee on our entire life, our entire way of being, you know, and it's kind of one of those things where you just, you know, you just shrug your shoulders because you just ask how much longer. And, and I'm a spiritual person. I'm not a Christian. I'm a spiritual believer's person. I believe in God with every problem of my being. I believe every step I've taken, both good and bad, he's been there with me. But I just sometimes wonder, how can you be a human being and treat others so unjustly? So I ask you, you know, what am I missing? What, what, what is it among the white community that, that has people think that we are something less than what they are? I, I, I think it's, I think it's ignorance. I mean, I, I think that people have not grown out of, that backwards thinking they've not had experience that 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 have shaped them otherwise um, they lack any you know true uh, faith in anything and and I think that I think it's out of ignorance I mean I, I just don't have any other answer but that I mean I, I they don't want to understand that they they feel threatened there's fear and, and i don't know why there's that fear uh, because the people with white skin have always had advantages over others so what are they afraid of you know you look at the population today and it is it is growing from the hispanics and the blacks and the asians and and i think at some point in the next five or ten years i think i read that that uh, the, the, the white race, the Caucasians, will be outnumbered by minority groups in general. And I think that there are some people that truly uh, fear that out of ignorance yeah. because it's taking something away from them that they've always had. Yeah. And, and, and with your staff, I heard you say that you, 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 you're checking in with them, checking to see how they are, your colleagues, your friends, and seeing how they are. And the stories you've heard, have they made you think that this particular point in time, there will be a change? Or do you think that when these protesters go home and COVID re reappears itself again, that we will go back to the way it was before Mr. Floyd died? I, I, I am prayerfully hopeful that this is a pivot point. I do believe it is a, a pivot point for our society. Um, we have an opportunity through elections to make change. Um, you know, people will say, well, you know, 1992, Rodney King, 60 people killed. I mean, I don't think we've faced a death in the, the, the violence that happened at the start of these protests. It's, it's way down, if any, right now. But people said if it didn't happen with Rodney King in 1992, when 60 people were killed, 
then what's, uh, why would you expect change today? And I think the difference is this, this time, every state in our nation is talking about this, is, is uh, having some sort of demonstrations to bring attention to it. It's, it's the white people and the brown people and the black people and the Asian that all holding hands together to do something where I don't think we've ever had that. Rodney King, it wasn't like that. Right. It was everyone else watching the, the black community on television. Right. But now I think that we have a more united front. I think people have more understanding, more compassion than they've ever had. And uh, I, I think if not now, it, it, it's not going to happen. And so I am hopeful that, you know, the things have shaped everything. You know, it's interesting you, that our president has been so loud and boisterous. And over these last couple of weeks, that voice has been drowned out. Yeah. You know, he, he, he's probably tweeting more than ever, but you don't hear that. You know, it's not getting the attention. This, is, this movement is getting the attention. And I think, I think people are getting their hearts and minds in the right place now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, speaking of uh, the current president, it was really impressive to see the military leaders understand that they were puppets in his photo op and to come out against that. That was pretty impressive to see these high ranking officers stand up and say, no, I did not mean what he intended. I was there because I was for another reason. Did you have some thought about that? I, I, ha I was very upset that, that when I first saw that, and I certainly judged that that person had been truly um, motivated by standing beside the president. But yesterday, he actually issued an apology, and he didn't make excuses. He could have very well said, well, I was actually, I thought we were going to inspect the National Guard troops. And, and he didn't say that in his apology. He simply said what I think is very right to say, you know, I was wrong. And the military is not to be participating in, you know, politics. And by the fact that I was there, I was wrong. You know, he didn't try to make it something other than that. He simply said I was wrong. And, and I think that, I think that satisfied a lot of people who were very concerned about, uh, the state of our military leadership of, uh, as of uh, last week. Yeah, absolutely, and, and they always say change starts with a small spark and maybe this small spark will result in change. Um, we have about five minutes, so I'm gonna give uh, three of those minutes to you, but I wanna ask one, one, one further question. You asked, what could you do? And as a black woman, your friend, your coworker, your colleague, I would just say, continue to have those discussions. Reach far down as you can to the janitor, to the, to the cook, all the way up to the president and have these conversations about what are we. Those of you that have a platform and have power are going to do to make our community better. I don't know if you've heard this, but among many black people that work at Duke, we call it the plantation. <sighs> because it feels like you're working at a plantation. You know, you're like expected to work twice as hard, produce, produce, and make less than others. So I would say if, if you could take any advice from me, have the conversations with everyone you can and try to elicit enough to help us figure out how do we create a dialogue that results in change. Well, I, I, uh, I will give you my commitment that I will do that. And what I am also doing is making other people listen. You know, it, it's, it's encouraging them that you, it's okay to talk about this at work. It's, it's okay to ask these questions. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. I mean, how do you think our, our black colleagues have felt all their life is uncomfortable? So, you know, if you're, if you're wiggling in your seat or you're feeling uncomfortable about uh, the discussions, then you're probably at the right point. And so uh, get uncomfortable. Absolutely. So I leave, I leave your last two minutes to you, whatever you wish to say. Oh, well, I, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I give this some thoughts sometimes and I, I worry a little bit and I'd just like to hear your perspective. 
of is it possible this pendulum for a while might swing too far in the direction of of the white community being patronizing um, of you know jobs that come open now someone is hired because they're black um, do do you have a concern about that I do. I absolutely do. Uh, I'm, I'm a hiring manager. I have um, about 17 or so people that report to me. I have a very diverse staff, but I don't hire by skin color. I don't hire by gender. I hire by who can do the job best. Because if I fail at the job, if that person fails at the job, it means I fail at the job, and then my job is more at risk than it already is. So I, I don't believe in hiring just because the person is black or brown or, or male or female or or, or, or a gay, um, I think it should be because the person is best qualified to do the job. What I, what I do say though, is that can we have a chance? So the application tracking system, a new algorithm now, that looks for certain criteria. How many people of color get out of that, that, that system and actually get an interview, get to talk to someone? And, and I know for you that you have done that for me and, and for others, so I do know that that's the case. But I do think that each time we encounter these issues, if you look around the room, there's only one black person, one female, one, one brown person, and there's a room of 50 or so people, something is not going right in your organization. You know, I heard a woman from the Washington Post, she gave a speech about a year and a half ago, and she said, people always ask why we don't have more black faculty or more black leaders. And she said, simply because we don't want them. And so I think that in this case, Make sure that the process is completely vetted. Um, there's a word that I was taught when I was getting my doctorate degree. I had never heard this word in my life before. It's called homosocial reproduction. We prefer to be with those who look like us. Back in my day, it was called the old boys club. You know, and so now as we're here, do we give everyone a fair chance? If you hire or interview, let me tell you about it. If you interview a black or brown person and that person cannot do your job, you should not hire that person. If you interview a woman and she doesn't seem to be qualified, don't hire that person. Hire the person that is going to be successful in the job for themselves and for you. I, I, I think that, uh, that you're absolutely right. And I, I appreciate hearing that opinion. And, and I appreciate you, you giving people voice to this topic and, and that you are certainly doing your part in in enlightening people and encouraging people uh i mean just the time you invest in these chats and and uh getting the word out i, I think it's just a worthwhile endeavor and, and uh i greatly appreciate and admire you rochelle for for doing this and i'm just i'm really proud to call you my friend same here dan same here but 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 really i wanted you know i had seen so many important and powerful people on television speaking about this but the people that are in the trenches they don't have a chance to speak about this. And so that's why I started these chats. They're by, you know, if you want to do it, you say you want to do it. Before I post your video, I send it to you. You look at it, you say, yep, that, that represents me or no, that doesn't represent me. Let's do it over or I don't want to do it. I give everybody that, that chance. I do not post until they have said, yes, this is okay with me. Um, and so my hope is, is that the people that are down here with me get a chance to have their voices heard and to hear voices of people like yourself, leaders, who are thinking about this now in a different way than they had before. So thank you. Thank you. Well, you stay safe, best to your family. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely, thank you so much. So I will send you the video as soon as it converts and you can just let me know whether I can post it or not, okay? Okay. Stay thank safe you. and tell Kitty I said hello. And I'm certainly wishing her well. Thank you, Dan. Thanks. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.